speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester. Rochester Indian Media. Barry Lynn, the executive director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, a watchdog over the religious right. It's been the organization Americans United for Separation of Church and State was started 60 years ago by a guy who was a former law school dean who left his political career as a Republican in order to come to Washington and fight against the intrusion of certain religious groups into the cultural and political life of the country. At the time, 60 years ago, the biggest danger was that the Roman Catholic Church was simply trying to take over institutions, including the public education system, by literally taking teaching nuns, going to school districts and saying, we'll give you free teachers. And those teachers, unfortunately, did teach reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion, which disturbed a whole lot of other people in many of those communities. So that was kind of the spark that set off this organization. There were efforts at that time, 60 years ago, to ban the importation of films because they made disparaging comments about the Catholic Church. The famous film from the 1950s, The Miracle, was not permitted to be imported through the port of New York because of pressure from the church. That's the kind of issue that started the organization. Incredibly, 60 years later, the players are somewhat different, but the issues remain the same. The religious right pretty much wants to tell people what to do from the moment of conception until the moment of death and pretty much every minute in between. That's got to be fought. Yeah, the religious right is not just any evangelical Christian you find or every Republican you find or even every conservative that you find. It's a very select, self-selected group of about 18 to 21 percent of the American electorate that characterizes themselves as either members of the religious right, they're proud to say that, or conservative Christians who do combine a political agenda with their religious worldview. So we're talking about people like the late Dr. Jerry Falwell and all of his followers, his organizations now under the control of his two sons, who have pretty much the same agenda that Jerry did. Uh, Pat Robertson, Dr. James Dobson, who although not a minister, he is a psychologist, but has an enormous amount of power within this movement of people who combine very fundamentalist religious doctrine with a very hardline right-wing political agenda. I think there's no doubt that in the last 50 or 60 years the wall of separation has gotten stronger. We don't have mandatory prayer in public schools. We don't simply give money with no strings attached to uh, any religious organization that asks for it. So there are a lot of things that have been improved. There's also something in the consciousness of the American people, and it, it's more important in some ways than what courts say or what Congress says. It's a sense that we are developing as a people, with the possible exception of the 18 to 20 percent or hardliners, that we are in a pluralistic society. We've got 2,000 different religions in this country. We have 20 million atheists, free thinkers, non-believers. We all kind of have to make it work. We know people who come from a different faith background. We know people who have no religious connections at all. We work with them. We study with them. We go to school with them. Sometimes we marry them. You know, we, we kind of get along better. The problem is that the 20 percent 
of folks on the religious right have an inordinate amount of power, political power, media power, and they're able to frighten people into doing things and taking positions that really I'd like to think most Americans would reject if they had the whole picture. But the religious right is really, really good at skewing the picture, falsifying. Well, certainly they have their own media. The religious right doesn't depend on getting on CNN. If they do, so much the better. But they also have their own instrumentalities. If you go to a place like Colorado Springs, Colorado, where James Dobson's focus on the family is kind of the biggest employer in town, I think literally is the biggest employer in town, um, if he doesn't get on TV, he just goes on his own radio program that's heard on a thousand stations in the United States and hundreds of more growing to be thousands of more around the world. Pat Robertson does the same thing. He is on television in every media market at least 90 minutes every day through an arrangement with the ABC Family Channel. This guy doesn't need to be a guest. He's the host. He's the orchestrator of the news as he wants to put it out. And frankly, for a lot of people in the United States and an even larger percentage of people in the world, when they hear about Christianity in America, the only kind of place to look to is, oh yeah, that Pat Robertson person, because he's on our local television in Bangkok, or he's in our local uh, you know, market anywhere in the world. So when he says inflammatory things about world politics or world issues, he's assumed to be the Christian idea. He is speaking for Christian America. That's pretty scary, because Pat says some pretty dumb things. You know, deregulation helped the religious right, but I think that we're kind of whistling past the graveyard if we think that's the only issue. If we get the fairness doctrine back, it'll make a big difference. It won't, because these guys were very smart, a lot smarter, I have to say, than those of us on the progressive end of the spectrum in identifying the need to capitalize on and get your own media, get your own voice heard, even if the major media is going to ignore you. So they were way ahead of us. Uh, they have all of the top, uh, when you think about who, who do you know on radio, Christian or otherwise, it's Rush Limbaugh, it's Laura Ingram, it's Ann Cole, all these people who have their own radio or television outlets, uh, with exceptions of uh, few, far between, and, and not getting huge market shares like Air America or Grit Television. The, they're late in the game, and they haven't yet created the kind of identifiable media figures that the right's been working on for 20 years. Now, I don't want to give the, any free pass to the mainstream media because they also tend to cover more those voices on the religious right. There are far more appearances by Jerry Falwell during his life, and prior to his death in April of 2007, than appearances by, say, the head of the National Council of Churches at that time, a man named Bob Edgar, who many people have never even heard of. But he was the head of the National Council of Churches, a former congressman from Pennsylvania and a minister. He was viewed as... He wouldn't say the extreme things, so he wasn't, it wasn't as important to get his voice heard, and he wasn't heard. That ought to be the voice of American Christendom at that time, if anybody was. Not Jerry Falwell, but that's not the way the major media picked, played it. Frankly, the public schools are still the great culture war battleground in most communities. It is their public school system. And there are two ways that the religious right approaches the school. They want to get things out of public education that they don't like and get into public education the things that they do like. For example, they hate evolution. They don't care that 99.9% .9 of the real scientists in the United States understand that evolution is fact, evolution is theory in the best sense of the word. It explains better than anything else uh, how we got to the point we are the diversity of species that we have. But they don't like it because it's not biblical, or they think it's non biblical. So they're trying either to frighten biology teachers out of teaching evolution, and they have a remarkable success rate at that. Some 40% of biology teachers in America's high schools admit that they give little, if any, time to a discussion of evolution because they're afraid of the backlash from students and their parents. 
at the same time, they want to get into schools these ideas like intelligent design, which is bogus, pseudoscience, has nothing to do with real science. It's just a cover for getting the Christian uh, creation story wearing kind of a white lab coat to make it look scientific into America's public schools. So they want to get good science out, junk science in. It works the same way with sex education. We have battles over whether we should teach sex education in America's schools, and most schools are so frightened that they don't teach comprehensive, age-appropriate sex education. Instead, they teach things like abstinence-only education, which doesn't work. I mean, that's not just an opinion. That's the clear evidence of social science data that goes back now for the last decade and a half. They want abstinence education in, even though it doesn't work, because it's compatible with what they think is the truth of the Bible. This is a, kind of a, an administration that takes everything on faith, I mean, including whether it's winning the war in Iraq, all the way down to whether abstinence-only education works. In spite of overwhelming data to the contrary, they say, we're going to fund things that fit into our religious outlook. And frankly, the faith-based initiative has done no good at all. It was deeply politicized, as even some of its former employees now admit, to be nothing but kind of walking around money for Republican candidates who go into a place, encourage church leaders from a community in a place where you're having a tight political race to come to some meetings be, with the lure of this faith-based money. Very few of those groups ever got the faith-based money, but some of those ministers said, well, I guess George Bush cares about us. And when we hear about some Republican who's running for office, who wants to support the president, uh, we're going to remember that he cares deeply about us. And then, of course, they never got 10 cents out of the deal. But nevertheless, that was the play that Karl Rove utilized so well in taking faith-based money, the little new money that they could scrounge up, and place it strategically in communities where they were looking to get electoral victories for the Republican Party. So it was like the old Democratic uh, walking around money in Chicago. You know, hey, gay pastor, here's some money. Make sure all your parishioners come and vote for the Democrats. This is just the 21st century equivalent of that. When it comes to other matters, I'd love to say this was some kind of a obvious one thing, George Bush, bad, everybody else is good. But we saw the Democratic Congress this past year authorized the expenditure of more money than ever before for faith-based uh, abstinence-only education. More money, even though those guys know just as well as George Bush, if he reads any of this stuff, which he probably doesn't, that these programs don't even work. So it's easy for people to say, if you want big change, it better come from the outside, because you can't expect that the Congress on its own is going to clean up the mess created by a president who, remember, believes he was selected by God to serve America at this time. And he said that to multiple people. A lot of people these days seem to be hearing God tell them very specific things about how to deal with everything from wealth accumulation to drilling in Alaska. And Sarah Palin's very much in that model. She's kind of the model religious right candidate for the presidency, or in this case, the, the vice presidency. And they'd be the first to tell you that they forced a choice like Sarah Palin on John McCain, a guy they never fully trusted, as holding on to the bona fides of the religious right. He'd been very critical, for example, of Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson in the past, and obviously was not their first choice to be the nominee of the Republican Party. Sarah Palin now is anti-reproductive choice, anti-GLBT rights, anti-stem uh, cell research, all because of a biblical basis for her opposition to those civil rights principles. And uh, the religious right loves it. She got as much applause as Ronald Reagan when her name was mentioned re recently at the Family Research Council's big values voter summit in Washington, D.C. She is the next superheroine of the religious right. And uh, she can pretty much take this, if not to the bank, possibly even to the White House. You know, uh, one of the ways that you get away with any contradiction, in say, including saying I'm pro-life, 
but I'm actually pro-war and I'm pro-death penalty. I meant life as in I'm only against abortion and stem cell research is because they don't get questioned about it. Uh, this is just a given that they can be completely hypocritical about this. There are some people on the religious right. I used to do a radio program every week with Oliver North, certainly is about as far to the right as you can get. And uh, he was consistently pro-life, at least insofar as his opposition to the death penalty and his opposition to abortion. So he's a guy who would intervene to try to literally save people's lives on death row. And I have to give him some credit for that level of consistency. He is a rare bird when it comes to that. In general, the religious right not only accepts the morality of the death penalty, but somehow finds ways to believe that it is even biblical uh, to support it, in spite of that fellow Jesus who said, when they were about to condemn a prostitute and throw her, uh, kill her with rocks, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. They seem to have forgotten that little passage in their relative interest in finding other obscure passages that do, they claim, relate to the issues that ran the gamut of economic policy to drilling in Alaska. There's a huge problem in the United States military that runs from the training that goes on at the Air Force Academy and other service academies all the way to the halls of the Pentagon where there are organized, very specific, clear and organized efforts to Christianize the United States military. And by Christianize, I mean right-wing Christianize the United States military. We first got into this at the Air Force Academy when one of our own members uh, who's subsequently gone on to form an organization to protect religious freedom within the military. But he called and said, you know, my son is noticing all of these evangelism efforts at the Air Force Academy, things like having the locker room of the football team have a giant sign up that said, Team Jesus, Team Jesus. Um, we started to investigate this. We did the first investigation of it. We asked cadets to talk to us. We asked people to send us anonymous emails if they felt that they couldn't disclose who or where they were. And we were finding even emails from one Mormon cadet who said that he was told during his tenure at the Air Force Academy, he was always placed in either the basement or the first floor, if that was the lowest living floor, of any barracks to which he was assigned. And when he asked why he was always in the basement, his commanding officer said, uh, well, because you're a Mormon, and since you're not going to convert to Christianity, well, Mormons, of course, consider themselves to be Christians, but you're not going to convert to Christianity, we're just putting you closer to hell because that's where you'll end up anyway. So this is not just about anti-atheism, although there's plenty of that. It's anti-Mormonism, it's anti-Catholicism, it's anti-everything but Christian evangelism as practiced by the so-called religious right. Now, it gets even worse because some of the same people who do graduate from these academies and get through the chain of command, get greater power over more and more people, look upon their job not as one of defense of the United States, but of the Christianization of the world. Our God against the Muslim God. And uh, there were some very high-ranking officials caught on videotape wearing uniforms, making speeches in churches, defining the war in Iraq as essentially a crusade of Christianity against Islam. Those people were not fired. They were hidden away into other bowels of the Pentagon, but they're still around. And then when you have those two factors, you combine one other thing. Private organizations that work very hard and very specifically to target Pentagon officials and high-ranking members of Congress who have control over the military budget to kind of create these private public partnerships of sharing faith together, and which again doesn't just mean having some nice Bible study, but means Christianize and find ways to Christianize the entire military using powerful congressional and Pentagon officials to do it. We have real trouble in this country. If you have a military that has its own agenda, that transcends the Constitution, and is all about one religious worldview. That's right. When they're not sure that they can win issues at the national level, and for a long time this year, they had given up on the national political scene, only recently have decided that they can, in fact, win again. 
they can get their candidates elected, not just as president, but also uh, to House and Senate seats that looked dubious uh, some months ago. They get local. They love to find ways to interject their theocratic vision into local community politics. So here in Greece, as I understand the history of this, there had been a moment of silence at the town council until the election of one gentleman who decided that he was going to go a step beyond. He was going to have a prayer to open every town council meeting. And for the last four years, with, the, with very rare exceptions, I think only three over the course of the last four years, it has been Christian preachers with highly Jesus-focused prayers being prayed at the town council, making people who are not Christian, or even some Christians, frankly, who don't perhaps pray for the same things that these guys did, feel like second-class citizens in their own community. In general, when we have found these hassles in other parts of the country, you write a letter, maybe you kind of suggest if they don't do the right thing, you might file a lawsuit. People get their lawyers together. They say, you know, we ought to be more open. We, I mean, after all, it's the 21st century. We ought to be open to having more people conduct these official prayers if we're going to have them. And they resolve the matter. In Greece, uh, this didn't happen. Um, letters were ignored. People were told that the policy would never be changed. Cases, courts, including federal appeals courts, not particularly liberal ones in all cases, have said that focused sectarian prayers, that focus on Jesus Christ, for example, cannot be prayed. If you're going to pray at a public gathering, a town council, a school board meeting, they have to at least be non-sectarian prayers. Some people say there is no such thing. Non-sectarian prayer, what, who are you praying to? What are you praying about? Somebody's once told me the only non-sectarian prayer started dear and ended amen and had no content in between. The law, the courts look at it a little differently. They say, where's the focus? If, are these all about Jesus? Do they invoke a specific deity or don't they? If they're generic, if they use phrases like Lord or Spirit, or then maybe you get a pass on those. But the ones in Greece are focused and designed to be focused to help Christians, uh, Christian ministers and Christian churches here get time before elected officials do their business. The Alliance Defense Fund is located out in Scottsdale, Arizona, and uh, was originally created as a kind of a, a clearinghouse for religious right lawsuits. A lot of other groups contributed money to form the group. The group now gets uh, about $35, $40 million a year, but it's got a life of its own now. It files a lot of litigation. It also defends often indefensible policies like that before the Greece Town Council. The Alliance Defense Fund is headed by Alan Sears, who came to prominence because he was the head of the Ed Meese pornog Anti-Pornography Commission back in the 1970s. Uh, Mr. Sears has gone on now to uh, find uh, new uh, ways to uh, challenge the constitutional rights of people to practice what they want to practice, if anything, to read what they want to read, if anything. And uh, he's been a, a very popular figure in the religious right. The Alliance Defense Fund is going to be in the news a great deal over the next month or so because they are asking local churches to violate their own tax-exempt status by promoting specific candidates in sermons on September 28th to preach in defiance of a ban on partisan politicking in the tax code that is required for both religious and secular nonprofits. You get a nonprofit status, it's worth a lot of money. The only real trade-off you have is you can't become a political action committee. You can't turn your money or your pulpit over to partisan electioneering. But they want that challenge. They say they'll go to the Supreme Court with it. It's been challenged. Every court that has ever looked at the provision prohibiting partisan activity has said it's a reasonable um, adjunct to tax-exempt status. You don't have any right to be tax-exempt, and you don't have right as a tax-exempt organization to turn yourself into a, a political arm of any political party. So you'll hear more about the Alliance Defense Fund. It will all be bad because they're the people who say, we love the law, 
unless we don't agree with the law, in which case we'll break it and say God told us to do that also. It's very hard for the media to be willing to utter words like extremist when it comes to Christian advocates in this country. Um, and uh, they have to get over that, frankly, because there are elements of the religious right, that 18 to 20 percent of Americans we've been talking about, who really are willing to use any tactic at all. I mean, it is a part of that 18 to 20 percent that are willing to go out and kill abortion providers, kill escorts at women's clinics. They're the people who decide that a Unitarian church in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, because they have two progressive views on gay and lesbian matters, should be the subject of an assault with, ri with a rifle just two months ago. I mean, these, uh, this kind of extremism does not, uh, it's a fraud to call it anything other than extremism. Now, there are people on the religious right who are kind of theocrats light. You know, they don't want to cut off your hands so you can't read a book. They just want to make sure the book's not in the library so you can take it down in the first place. So maybe that's a little kinder, gentler form of the same extremist agenda. We know the truth. There's no sense in having you folks out there reading anything that's not our truth. There's no sense ultimately in allowing you religious freedom because the real religion is Christianity. We know that. We're just going to either convince you or we're going to make you do what we believe. So, as I said earlier, they want to control your life from the moment of conception until the moment of death. They want to make all your decisions for you. They are fundamentally at odds with what I think, as a Christian minister, is this one of the central messages of the Christian faith, which is that we have free will. We have the right to make choices. We have the right to look at our own conscience and decide where it takes us. They've decided that a couple of spokespeople, spokesmen in every instance, for the religious right will tell all of us in every community how to live. That's why they're so dangerous. They're not going away. If we think that they've left because Jerry Falwell died or D. James Kennedy died last year, we're whistling past another graveyard. Okay, well, thank you very much. Certainly, it's a pleasure talking with you. All in it together whether we're religious or secular, whether we're Catholic or Protestant or Jew or Muslim, we got to make the system work. And if 20% of us are going to be the impediment to it, then eventually we just have to marginalize them for the extremists that in fact they are.